my favorite TV shows that I tend to watch when I can't fall asleep or when I wake up at 3 a.m. and I, it's past the hour of no return. So you're frustrated with life and so you flip on TV. Is uh, the TV show called uh, Who Do You Think You Are? Does anybody watch that besides me? Anybody else nerdy? Okay. Oh, yeah, good. Well, a fellow nerd. Good. Uh, what it is, who do you think you are? It used to be on PBS, now it's on uh, NBC. It's a show that picks a celebrity. And of course it has to have a celebrity to hook you in, but it picks a celebrity, and with the help of local historians and Ancestry.com, the historians will... Um, trace a celebrity's family line, somebody that they had questions about, they're curious about, something they just don't know much about. And oftentimes, they'll, they'll take the celebrity to different places so they can see where their family grew up, where their ancestors connect, uh, where their ancestors lived their life. And, and again, they connect with local historians and they start to explain the circumstances of their ancestor's life. And it's always... Every episode I've watched so far is always interesting to me because within every family tree, there are saints and then there are some pretty tremendous sinners. And it reminds me of everybody's family tree is that we all have skeletons in our family's closets. Because some people, it, you see it all the time in this show, how, who do you think you are? Some people in the family tree, they do really amazing things. And then others do some really wicked things. And it's interesting to watch the emotional journey that the celebrity goes on as they're, as they're putting together the pieces of their family history. And the pieces are starting to connect in their mind. And maybe you've done some of this in your own life where you, you start learning about your family's history and pieces in your mind start connecting and you think to yourself, aha, that's why my family moved from here to there. That's why my family... Uh, had this occupation. That's why my family thought this way about that certain things. It puts, starts to put pieces together in people's mind. Well, two Saturdays ago, I woke up early, 3 a.m., just the time for some reason. I'm in this terrible sleep habit. 3 a.m., and it's on TV. And it's uh, an episode uh, with Josh Demel. Does anybody know Josh? It's Josh Demel, sorry. Josh Demel. Does anybody know that name? Josh Demel starred in all the Transformer movies. So for research this week, um, spent a lot of time, no, uh, he started in all the Transformer movies, and he, he it, according to the show, he's a devout Catholic, and he had a lot of questions about his grandmother's side of the family, and so he gets on this show, and with the help of Ancestry.com and local historians, he traces his grandmother's lineage 12 generations back to his 12th great-grandfather, a guy by the name of Thomas Norton, who lived in England and studied at Cambridge. And so DeMel, he goes there, and he discovers that his 12 times great-grandfather was good friends with John Calvin. Okay, that elicited a response. Good. A lot of people know that John Calvin um, is one of the leading figures in the, in the Protestant Reformation. Remember, what is DeMel? He's a Catholic. So his 12-time great-grandfather is, was hobnobbing, was writing correspondence to his good friend John Calvin. But more than that, he was the son-in-law of Thomas Cramner. Anybody know that name? Thomas Cramner was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, he wrote the Book of Common Prayer, or collected the essays of the Book of Common Prayer. He was an Anglican, again, a Protestant. But more than that, he found out that Thomas Norton, his 12-time great-grandfather, wrote a play that was performed before Queen Elizabeth I. And the play, um, history, almost every historian agrees that Shakespeare picked up on some of its themes and directly imported them into King Lear. Now, what's the mall? He's an actor. So he hears this news. My, my, he thought he was from a, just a bunch of ragtag family. He, all of a sudden, he finds out, oh, no, he wrote a play that was performed before King, Queen Elizabeth I, and Shakespeare picked it up and directly imported it into King Lear. He can't believe how good this news is. He's like, this is amazing. He actually says in there, he goes, this is wonderful news. It's a dream come true. 
I'm so proud of my 12-time great-grandfather. But then he finds out later, as they keep tracing the family tree, particularly Thomas Norton, that what Thomas Norton is most known for is not a playwright. He's not known mostly for being good friends with John Calvin. He's not mo known mostly for, for being the son-in-law of Thomas Cranmer. He's not mostly known for in, in, uh, influencing and inspiring Shakespeare and King Lear. What he's most known for, the title he's most known for, is the title of Rackmaster. Rackmaster. Well, what's a rackmaster? Here's what a rackmaster was. A rackmaster was a guy who tortured Catholics by putting them on a rack and stretching their limbs out to the point where they would pop out of their joints. That's what Thomas Norton is most known. Now, again, what is Josh Dumel? He's a Catholic. So what his great, 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 great grandfather is most known for is being the rackmaster. At the London Bridge, down at the bottom, there was a rack that they would torture Catholics. Anybody who was suspected of trying to overthrow Queen Elizabeth I because she was a Protestant. And all of a sudden, in Dumel's mind, he goes from being extremely proud of great-grandpa Thomas Norton to saying on the show, he goes, I'm utterly perplexed and disgusted. Family histories are a little messy, are they not? <laughs> I bet you, if you spent a little bit of time digging up your family history, you would find some things in there that would make you incredibly proud. And then I bet you, you would find some things in there that would perplex you, and maybe even disgust you. Is that not true? And maybe, maybe you've done some digging like that also, and there's parts of it that you're thrilled by, other parts you're not so much thrilled by. But there's scandal. Here's the thing. There's scandal in every family tree. And in Genesis chapter 38, you can go ahead and turn there. In Genesis chapter 38, we'll see scandalous behavior from one of Jacob's sons that reverberates down through history and on into eternity. So Genesis chapter 38 is where we're going to be. Now, as you turn there, uh, let's do a show of hands. How many of you read ahead this week? Raise your hands. Raise them up. Raise them up. Okay, when you read ahead this week, maybe did you think to yourself, what in the world? Why is he preaching this passage on Mother's Day? <laughs> did anybody think that? I certainly did. I, I read it this week, and I thought, what am I doing? You're not the only one who thought that. Um, there's an old commentator by the name, scholar, by the name of H.C. Uh, Leupold. He, he wrote commentaries, and his commentary on the book of Genesis, in each section at the back end of it, he has little preaching tips for the preacher who's going to preach the passage. And on this passage, he wrote this. He says, it is entirely unsuited for homiletical use. <laughs> I love it. That's a fancy way of saying, don't even try to preach it, brother. There is no way you should try to preach this passage. That's what he's saying, but I'm going to try. Um, because I actually think there's some really good nuggets deep in the very end of it. Um, because while it is a sordid tale, and while there is scandal within it, at the back end of the scandal is something that's very surprising. And more than that, redemptive. So, Genesis 38 is where we're going to be. I'm going to turn my Bible to the book of Genesis. Genesis 38. Now, the background, of course, is we've been in the book of Genesis for a good amount of time now. And beginning in chapter 37, the scene shifts from focusing on Jacob to focusing on Jacob's sons, particularly Joseph and then also Judah. Uh, so Joseph and Judah. And Joseph, of course, because Joseph's story sets the stage for the next 430 years of Israel's history in, in Egypt. But Judah also, because it's through Judah that the great promise given to Abraham about God's coming king would come about. And Genesis chapter 38, it traces, it traces the beginning of that story. And so before we jump into the text, let me give you the outline right up front. You'll see it. Um, so you can kind of see where we're going. In verses 1 through 11, here's what we're going to see. 
If you're a note taker, take note. Verses 1 through 11, we'll see Judah's deception. Judah's deception and social injustice. Now, don't let the word social injustice trigger you. But it is, he does some serious socially unjust things. So, 1 through 11, uh, Judah's deception and social injustice. And then in verses 12 through 30, we'll see uh, Tamar's deception and sexual entrapment. So one will do something that's socially unjust. He'll, he'll cause injustice by deceiving, and she'll cause sexual entrapment by deception. So let's jump into the text beginning in verse 1. We're going to see uh, Judah's deception and social injustice. Here we go. Verse 1. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her. And she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ar. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Chizib when she bore him. So the account starts out that sometime after the event of Joseph being sold and carried off to Egypt, that Judah decides that he's going to go outside of the promised land. He's going to leave his brothers, he's going to go outside the promised land, and he's going to go to the city of Adullam. And Adullam was a royal Canaanite city. Well, why would he go there? Well, because his friend, Hira, also a Canaanite, was from there. And while he was there, now just that alone, what I just told you alone should start sending all sorts of triggers off in your mind. This is not going to end well. He goes to a Canaanite city. He has Canaanite friends. None of this is going to end up going well. And you're right. So while he's there... He meets a Canaanite woman. And we don't know her name. She's never named in the account. But he meets her, he marries her, and he bears children with her. Which, this is the very thing that Abraham and Isaac feared. This is the very thing that contributed to Esau's rejection. And now Jacob's sons are doing all of this. Freely, willy-nilly, they're going about uh, hanging out with the Canaanites, associating with them, marrying them, producing children with them. And over time, Judah and this Canaanite woman, they have three sons. The first born is Er, and the middle son was Onan, and then the youngest son was Shelah. And again, the woman, uh, since, since the woman's not named, this story is really about uh, Judah and the three sons. Judah and these three sons. So verse 6 and Judah took a wife for heir, his firstborn. And her name was Tamar. Um, and most scholars think that Tamar is probably 14 to 15 years old at this point. Remember, they married women off right after puberty. And so 14, 15 years old is she, that is she is. And heir is probably just a little bit older. He may be 16, 17, maybe 18 years old, something like that. So a little bit of age gap there, but she's this young girl, 14, 15 years of age, verse 7. But Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Whoa! Don't you want to know what he did that caused the Lord to put him to death? Um, that caused the Lord to decide to take him? We don't know. The, the scriptures don't tell us. But it must have been extremely displeasing to the Lord because we've seen all sorts of sinfulness and stupidity on the parts of Jacob and his sons, and the Lord doesn't take them. But we have seen throughout the, the Genesis account that the Lord brought wholesale judgment in Genesis chapter 6 against the sins of humanity. We've also seen the Lord take out a certain community, Sodom. Uh, the Lord brought Sodom against uh, for all of their, their wickedness. So whatever he was doing, whatever um, habitual practice he was doing, Whatever he, was his custom of living, it was on the level of that sort of wickedness. And so the Lord, the narrative, interprets his death as divine justice. And the Lord takes him. So Judah's firstborn, the son who was to carry on the family name, 
The son who was to receive the firstborn blessing is no longer. And Judah, Judah has to be thinking, well, who will carry on the family line? Well, look at verse 8. Then Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. <laughs> now we read this and we're like, what in the world is that about? Well, here's what it's about. Uh, women, women, uh, widowed women were socially and economically incredibly vulnerable in that society. This is not a free market society where they can just go out and get a job. A once married widowed woman, it was very unlikely, very, very unlikely that another man would choose her. And so therefore they were economically, um, they were enormously economically vulnerable, incredibly vulnerable position economically. And therefore there was an enormously important law to protect widowed women in those societies. And the law was called the Levrite marriage law. The Levrite marriage law. It comes from the Latin word uh, lever, which means brother-in-law. And what the, Le the Levrite marriage law was, it was this. The father of the dead husband, the father of the dead husband, which in this case would be Judah, it was his job to be the defender and the provider for the widow. In this case, Tamar. And if he had other sons... He had to provide them. It was the law. It was her social right. He had to provide his other sons. Um, so the next one in line would have been Onan. This was his job. It was absolutely his responsibility. This was the practice of the Near Eastern societies at that time. The father was responsible to provide another son. If he had any, and if he didn't have any, then he himself was obligated to take her as a wife and raise up children. And any children that would, have, that would have came about would have carried on the family name of the deceased son. And eventually, they would have carried on the family estate. Now, what this was, this was a very gracious... Some of you guys are looking at me like, this is crazy. But what this is, this is a very gracious law. It was a way to ensure that widows held on to the property that they had. Because property in that day, property was life. It was a way that you could make money. It was, you could work it yourself. If you, had, if you had kids, you could work it yourself and make money that way. You could lease it out to other farmers. You could make money that way. Or you could sell it. And in order to make sure that the widow held on to her property, the brother-in-law was to go uh, produce children for his older brother. The children wouldn't even belong to the, to the biological dad. It would belong to the older brother the deceased brother, so that his family name would carry on so that she could keep the property. Does that? Are you guys following with me? Okay, so this was a very gracious law. Um, and so Judah looks at Onan and says, you're up. I need you to go produce offspring for heir and carry on the family name to make sure that she's cared for. And so Onan says, sure, Pops. Okay, let's go. So verse 9 but Onan knew, now look at this, but Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. Hmm. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as, to not, so as not to give offspring to his brother. So he has absolutely no incentive. Now think about it. He has no incentive to produce offspring because if he were to produce offspring... What would it do? Here's what it would do. It would reduce his and his children's inheritance. If the older brother is dead and there's no offspring, then the double portion that would have went to the brother, the older brother, it now comes to me. And it now comes to my offspring. But if I were to produce an offspring for my older brother, that portion, that double portion, would go to him. So he's looking at this situation and he's saying, I have no incentive at all to actually cause her to be, become pregnant. Uh, because, again, right now, it's just him and his younger brother, Sheila, who are going to be inheritors. But if Tamar was to conceive a child, it would belong in the line of heir. It would receive heir's inheritance. And so Onan engages in coitus interruptus. It's the only time you get to use that phrase is when you're in church. Coitus interruptus. Um, 
What it is, he enjoys sexual gratification without bearing any responsibility. He enjoys sexual gratification while ensuring that she doesn't conceive. Again, sexual gratification without more, any moral responsibility. Sounds like a lot of dudes in our culture. This is what Onan does. He's completely deceiving her. Uh, well, maybe not deceiving her because she knows what he's doing. But he's deceiving his dad. He's saying, yeah, dad, I'll go do this. And he just keeps doing it, keeps spilling his semen on the ground, keeps deceiving his dad. The Lord knows what he's doing, though. And so verse 10, and what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord. And so the Lord put him to death also. So now a second son of Judah is dead. And he's got to be worried about who's going to carry on the family line. And so verse 11 Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. So Shelah couldn't be that far behind uh, Onan, maybe, maybe four or five years younger. And so Judah looks at Tamar and says, don't call us, we'll call you. Um, that's, that's his plan. Don't call us, you go. Now remember, who has responsibility for her? Judah does. But what does he do? He pawns her off and says, go back to your father's house. Don't call us, we'll call you. When Sheila comes of age, we'll make sure it happens. And she's put out, completely put out. And she gets the graduation newsletter. Here's the picture of the graduation. He's of age. He's all the, all the things. She knows his age. She knows when it's coming about. Time goes by. She knows she's being deceived. Um, this is a horrible thing. Couldn't, he couldn't have been that far behind. But Judah was completely deceiving her. He had no intention of giving Sheila to her because he's living in denial. He's absolutely living in denial. He thinks the fault lies with her. But it was Judah's wicked sons. We've already seen it. It was Judah's wicked sons who were actually at fault. What he doesn't want to do, he doesn't want to admit how wicked his kids are. He doesn't want to admit how much of a mess his kids are or how much of a mess of a father he must have been. And so he wants to to pin the blame on the woman. What Judah is doing is depriving this woman of her rights. He's depriving her of her rights because he he has something that only he can give. And she, she is absolutely obligated to it. He's, she is absolutely obligated to say, the, I have a right to Sheila. But because of his selfishness, he's relegated her to a dead-end life. Because again, a widow in that society, they were unbelievably economically vulnerable. So by doing this, he's relegated her to a dead-end life. She'll be destitute and living in poverty, and she knows it, and Judah knows it. What Judah has done here is deceived, and he has done social injustice towards her. By his deception, he has caused her to become destitute. He's caused her to be in a position where she's going to have to beg. And so what she decides to do in verses 12 through 30 is she decides she's going to take matters into her own hands. And if he won't give me my right, then I'll take it. And it is the most shocking thing that she does. Because what we'll see, she deceives Judah and she sexually entraps him. Incredibly shocking, bold move that she does. Look at verse 12. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, in the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shearers, he and his friend Hira, the Adulamite. So he's going up to Timnah, sheep shearing time. It was a time of celebration. You worked hard, but you played harder. And uh, Tamar, Tamar, she knows this. And so she makes this incredibly bold move. Look at verse 13. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garment and covered herself with a veil wrapping herself wrapping herself up and she sat at the entrance to Inna which is on the road to Timnah 
for she saw that Sheila was grown up and she had not been given to him in marriage. When, now, look at what she's just done. She puts herself at this entrance of this city where she knows he's going to pass by. And she knows of Judah's sexual ethics or lack thereof because she dresses like a prostitute. She puts on this veil to conceal her identity. And she must know, if I put myself out there, he will come. He will take me. I will get what I want. Because Sheila has not been given to me. The next of kin then is Judah. And Judah, I know his sexual ethics, or lack thereof. I know that he'll engage. She puts herself out there. This is an incredibly bold, risky move. But she, she takes it. She has no other choice. And so she takes it. Verse um, verse 15, when Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, come, let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me that, I, that you may come into me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, if you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, what pledge shall I give you? She replied, your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Now look at what she's doing. She's, she, she uses against Judah the um, double standard of the day. The double standard of the day was, was that it was fine for men to sleep around, but not fine for women to sleep around. And she uses that whole double standard against him. And she, she knows it because she knows how, how, how much he sleeps around. She knows that Sheila is not going to be given to her. She knows she has a legal right to bear up a child from Judah's line. And if Judah's not going to provide she Sheila, then darn it, she's going to do it. She's going to go to the next of kin. So she takes off her widow's clothing, which was very easy to see. Widow's clothing was, a, everybody knew what widow's clothing looked like. She put a veil over her face to conceal her. And then Judah promises when he sees her, he promised her to send her a goat. But she very shrewdly says, give me a pledge. And so Judah does. He gives her a signet, a cord, and a staff. Now the signet, it was uh, some piece of metal or stone that had your personal seal on it. And then a cord around it, that's the cord, so it hung over your neck. And when you rolled it across, uh, when you rolled it across uh, soft clay, it would bear your insignia. Um, kind of like we live in a rural environment, and you all, some of y'all live near farms that have cattle and they have their brand on it, and you know instantly just by seeing the brand who the cattle belongs to. That's the same way with the signet. Uh, you would roll it across the clay, you would see a little insignia, and you say, aha, that belongs to that person. And then also the staff, which also would bear your insignia on it. So Tamar very wisely says, give me your signet, your cord, and your, your staff as a pledge. And Judah does. Why? Well, because he's not thinking with his brain. Uh, he does. Robert Altler, the great Hebrew scholar, he says at this point, he says, this would be like leaving your credit card with a prostitute. Not really the wisest move you could make. But that's Judah. That's, he's so in lust with her that he says, okay, here's everything that identifies who I am. In, this, in that culture, here's everything I have that identifies who I am. That's the move he makes. And so verse 20, he, does, he uh, goes into her. She conceives uh, that when, verse 20, when Judah sent the young goat by his friend, uh, the Adulamite, to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. And he asked the men of the place, where's the cult prostitute who was at Inna on the roadside? And they look at him and say, what are you talking about? There's no cult prostitute who's been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I've not found her. Also, the men of the place said, no cult prostitute has been here. And Judah replied, let her keep the things as her own or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat, and you did not find her. Notice this. He's worried about being laughed at. He's very concerned about his reputation. Not so much concerned with keeping his social responsibility towards Tamar. 
And this is where it gets incredibly good. Look at verse 24. About three months later, Judah was told. uh, Yeah, about three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she's pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. Now look at the double standard here. Look at the double standard. It's okay if he engages in a little bit of sexual play, but she better not. And she's so enraged. He's so enraged by it that he's going to burn her. That's his plan. And, and this didn't happen often in that culture. There was not a lot of burning of people alive, but he had the legal authority to do it. Even though he's relegated her to her father's household, he has the legal authority over her. And he could have, he could have stoned her and then burned her alive. And he's so enraged by this that he says, bring her out. We're going we're gonna to burn her. And no doubt the news of this starts trickling out throughout the village. And so everybody, everybody just like anytime there's a mob mentality, everybody starts coming out. They're, everybody's a rubbernecking, and they come out into the village, and they say, oh, we're going to, everybody's filled with righteous indignation. We're going to make sure this doesn't happen in our village ever, ever again. We're going to take back our village, and we're going to burn her. We're going to probably stone her and burn her alive. They're righteous indignation over what Tamar has done. Look at verse 24. Verse 25, I'm sorry. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, by the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Look at, look at the words here. Um, please identify. In the, the Hebrew, the, the word there, it means recognize. Recognize whose signet and cord and staff these are. And in that moment, she gets a little bit of revenge. And Judah recognizes what's taking place. Look at verse uh, 26. Then Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Sheila, and he did not know her again. In that moment, Judah recognizes for the very first time his sin. And by the way, um, do I have time? Yeah, I got time. By the way, look how nuanced the Bible is here. Look how nuanced it is. Because Judah does not say she's guiltless and I'm guilty. Nor does it say she's innocent and I'm not innocent. What does it say? She's more righteous than I. She's not completely righteous. And look at what he's saying. He's saying she's not completely righteous. She is guilty of sexual entrapment. But Judah recognizes he's more guilty. He's more guilty. Yes, she's done wrong, but Judah has done a greater wrong. She committed sexual entrapment, but Judah has engaged in social injustice which according to him, in this instance, it's the greater sin. Look how nuanced the Bible is. Look at the Bible. Does this make you uncomfortable? Because it should. You see, the liberal take would be, she didn't do anything wrong. She did what she needed to do, and it's her body, so she's sinless. But the conservative take would be, sexual sin is a horrible thing. And if you had to rank them, This would be up near the top. Sexual entrapment would be up near the top. If you went to a person and asked them if they're for traditional values, and they said yes, and you asked them, well, is social oppression a traditional value? They would probably say no. But if you asked them, is adultery a traditional value? Something that you would be against? Is prostitution? a traditional value that you'd be against, they would say yes. But here, but see, what you have here doesn't fit into the liberal or the conservative take. It doesn't fit into the liberal take. It doesn't fit into the conservative take. Because what you have here is Judah essentially saying, I oppressed her. 
Because I oppressed her, though she is wrong, and though she did commit a sin, I'm more guilty because of the sin that I committed. My sin was a contributing factor to her sin. Now look at, again, look at how nuanced the Bible is. Because it doesn't fit into the Republican paradigm where everybody, everything is a personal responsibility, nor does it fit into the Democratic paradigm where everybody's just a product of social factors and they bear no responsibility. It doesn't do either of these two things. But what it does, what the Bible does really clearly, is it tells us that social injustice is actually a serious sin. It's a serious sin. And it calls us to examine ourselves apart from party affiliation and ask ourselves, am I using the power, the position, and the privileges that I have to help those who are the have-nots? The Bible is certainly calling us to do that because God calls us to help the have-nots. And when we don't, it is actually social injustice. And that, according to the Bible, is a serious sin. Tamar, the heroine of this story, goes after justice. She goes after what's her legal right. She gets the justice she needs. And in so doing, she brings Judah to the point of repentance, which is what he needs. He recognizes it and he says, she's more righteous than I. Hmm. Just interesting side note. Look at verse 27. When the time of her labor came, back to the story. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand and the midwife took it and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, this one came out first. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out. <laughs> and she said, what a breach you've made for yourself. Therefore, his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Now, let me ask you, does that little story right there remind you of anything? The birth of twins, does that remind you of anything else? Maybe Jacob and Esau? Jacob and Esau, the twins. Judah has now twins, uh, Zerah and Perez. And just like how Esau was the older, and Esau means Edom, Edom means red, this one comes out first, this hand comes out first, they tie a scarlet, scarlet thread around him, scarlet ribbon around him, and then he pulls his hand back, and the other one comes out first. Perez comes out first, and it's Perez, the younger, who's actually going to be blessed. And so what the author is telling us, just in this little per pericope right here, verses 27 through 30, is that what was happening in Jacob's family is happening in Judah's family. And God will choose the younger again. The younger, again, will be served by the older. And the blessing will come through Perez, the younger, and not the older, Zerah. And with the birth of these twins, the account ends right there, and we'll do the same. Um, oh, man, I only got five minutes. Do you guys have lunch plans? <laughs> Mother's Day lunch, anything like that? I'll move quick. You know, you read this account, and it is a sordid tale. It is absolutely a sordid tale. There's social injustice. There's sexual entrapment. It's another chapter that you look at in the Bible and you're like, what is this doing here? Why is this in the Bible? But it has so much to teach us. So let me close just by bringing out three things that this passage teaches us, three things that come straight out of this passage. Here's the first one. What does it teach us? What do we see? We see the truthfulness of the Scriptures. We see the truthfulness of the Scriptures, which means... You can totally trust the Scriptures. These stories, these sordid, ugly, messy stories that we have seen over and over and over again, what they do is they show the credibility of the Bible. They actually show the credi credibility of the Bible. They show the credibility about the Bible and about the seriousness of sin and its consequences. Let me read you a quote from Dale Ralph Davis. He's an Old Testament 
I think he's with the Lord now. Um, but he was an Old Testament scholar and author. He writes this. He says, here in Genesis chapter 38 is a lurid moral mess conducted by one of the fathers of Israel. What is so outstanding is that it's told at all. The lying and lechery, the warts and wickedness, all are there for all to see. No one gave the biblical writer hush money Yet Israel had every reason to launder her tradition of her, na- of the, her nation's fathers. Why besmirch her past by telling the seemly, unvarnished truth about her ancestors? But the fact that they did tells me that I can trust this record. This is a book that dares to let the truth fall where it will. And he's, think about it, he's absolutely correct. Because if you were writing a piece of fiction regarding the origins of religion, would you include this account in it? (laughs) Heavens, no, you wouldn't include this account of it. That one of the the fathers of your faith thought thought that his daughter-in-law was a prostitute and he came into her and he committed social injustice along the way. There's no way you would make this up. No way. You wouldn't write of the moral mess of your ancestors. What would you write of? you would tell of how all of their victories. You would tell about all of their virtues and how heroic they are. The fact that the, Bible, the biblical writers tell us again and again and again of their failures tells us that you can totally trust the Scriptures. You can absolutely trust the Scriptures that they're telling you the truth. And that's good news. You can trust them. Here's the second thing we, we see. We see the transformation of Judah. We see the transformation of Judah Here's what that means. It means that life change is available. We see the transformation of Judah, which means that life change is available. But in order for that to happen, in order for life change to happen, a couple of things have to happen first. Well, what do we see with Judah? He recognizes his sin. It's brought out into the open. He recognizes his sin. He repents of it, and he turns away from it. This is what we see in Judah. Think about what we've seen in Judah. No, back away from this story and just think about what we have seen in Judah in his character up to this point. Here's what we've seen so far in his character. He's ruthless in his relationship with Joseph, selling him into slavery. He's heartless in his relationship to his father, lying to him and telling him his son was dead. He's fearful of losing another son by death. He's unjust in refusing to give Sheila to Tamar. He's lustful by sleeping with Tamar, and then he's indignant when Tamar becomes pregnant. And yet, now, so horrible, all the way through. You look at Judah and you're like, this guy's a moral mess, and he is. And yet, when his sin is revealed to him, when the signet and the staff are brought out, and there's no place he can hide his sin anymore, he recognizes it, he acknowledges it by saying, she's more righteous than I. And that's language of repentance. And then did you notice in verse 26 that Moses tells us, if you have your Bible still open, you can look at it. Moses says, he, that's Judah, did not know her again. Meaning that once he recognized his sin and he repented of it, he then turned from it. And it wasn't going to become an ongoing thing in his life. He turned from his sin. So the sin is revealed to him, he repents of it, and then he turns from it. And that begins the process of life change for Judah. And he actually goes, Judah actually goes from being this horrible moral mess of a person to actually becoming the leader of the 12 12 tribes of Israel and becoming a gracious and humble person. Now, you know what that, do you see what that means for you? You see what that means for me? It means that life change is available for you. It's, it's available for you. But it begins by recognizing your sin, repenting of it, and turning from it, and embracing the way of Christ. So what do we see so far? The truthfulness of Scriptures, which means you can totally trust them. The transformation of Judah, which means life change is available. And then lastly, we see the threat of redemption. We see the threat of redemption. And here's what that means for you, and we'll go there in a second. But what we see here is the threat of redemption, which means the scandal of your life doesn't have to overshadow God's purposes for your life. The scandal of your life doesn't have to overshadow God's purposes for your life because it's right here in the moral darkness of this family that God's grace is breaking in. How? 
with the birth of Perez. Turn over to Matthew's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel, I'll close with this. Matthew's Gospel is the first book in the New Testament. How is God's grace breaking into this moral mess, this scandal? Well, it's with the birth of Perez. Look at the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Oh my. Now here's the amazing thing about Matthew chapter 1. There's five women in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Historically, throughout the church, these have been called the five mothers of Jesus because to see a woman's name in the genealogy at that point in that time meant that something significant was happening there. Uh, So the five mothers of Jesus, and there they are. Look look again. There's Tamar. We see it in verse 3. There's Rahab, the prostitute, in in verse 5. There's Ruth, the Moabitess, also in verse 5. And then in verse 6, you also have Bathsheba, who David committed adultery with. So the five, and then you have Mary later. So the five mothers of Jesus, all in some way with tremendous scandal in their stories. Why? Well, Let me read you another quote. This is by Victor Hamilton. He says, Each of these four women, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba, had highly irregular and potentially scandalous marital union. Nevertheless, these unions were, by God's providence, links in the chain to the Messiah. Accordingly, each of them prepares the way for Mary, whose marital situation is also peculiar, given the fact that she's pregnant but has not yet had sex with Joseph. Thus, the inclusion of the likes of Tamar in this family tree foreshadows the circumstances of the birth of Christ. Now listen to what he says. The Lord has worked His will in the midst of the whispers of scandal. I love that. He's worked His will in the midst of the whispers, whispers of scandal. So out of this moral mess. Now what are we seeing here? This is Mother's Day. How of this moral mess comes the Messiah? You know what that means? It means the scandal of your life doesn't have to overshadow God's purposes for your life because out of the moral mess, God's grace will meet you there. His grace will meet you right in the midst of your mess. And do we see that here? Yeah, why? Well, because it's from Tamar and Judah that the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Messiah, emerges. The, what, have you ever thought about where's that phrase come from of Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah? Here it is. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah who will defeat sin on your behalf, who will go to war on your behalf and defeat sin and give you new life in his name. And it all comes out right here. Out of the moral mess of the Judah and Tamar story comes the Messiah who will redeem anybody who looks at their life and says, I have too much scandal in my life. I can't be saved. Oh no, heavens no. No, 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 no. Out of the mess comes the Messiah who will defeat and redeem anybody who comes to him in faith. Amen. Let me pray, and I'll let you go. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage. It's a messy one. There's no doubt about it, Lord. And yet, you're in the business of bringing good things out of messy things. You're in the business, as we sang about, of bringing gardens out of graves. 
And Lord, we are so thankful for that news. We're so thankful for your grace that meets us at the bottom and meets us in the muck and the mess of our lives and will redeem us and bring us forward and enable us to walk with you faithfully. And so, Father, we pray as we leave here and we go back into our homes this afternoon on Mother's Day, that while we will celebrate mom, we will worship you because you have redeemed us completely. We trust you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.